my screen real quick. So thank you everyone for joining. Um, Kristen said, my name is Ofer, I'm, I'm the CTO at Carbon Relay. Um, I'll be talking to you today about resource management in Kubernetes and uh, what it means, and tell you a bit about what we do to uh, all with that. So hopefully you all can see my screen. Um, start with a quick agenda. So some of the topics we'll be talking about today, obviously resource management is a big thing, which is a lot of different um, topics. I'm gonna focus, starting with the basics, requests, limits, quality of service, uh, and if these things don't make sense to you, well, hopefully they will soon. We'll talk about common pitfalls, uh, both my experience, the company's experience, and I'm sure at least some of you will have experienced that before, um, moving to best practices and what you should be doing when you're looking into uh, resource allocation in Kubernetes. And then we'll shift into uh, what I consider a slightly more advanced topic in terms of performance optimization, resource utilization, and, and tuning evolving application. And, um, what we call the continuous optimization process on Kubernetes. Obviously, at the end, uh, I'll leave time for, for your questions. Hopefully, um, I can answer all of them. So, to start off, why are we even talking about resource management? Um, but hopefully, for those of you who are here, you're not actually asking that question. Um, but as background, you know, for those of you who've, who've been in, in the development uh, world for a while, you know that in the old days, we had applications that were running standalone. Right. I would write my application, this big monolith of code, and my expectation would be to deploy it to a single machine. And that box is all my application had to play with, and it would grab as many resources as it could. Because it was standalone, there was no need for uh, any kind of fencing or gating. There was no noisy neighbors, which I'll talk about later. Um, life, life was nice and simple. Um, obviously, that's not the future, not where we're going, and it's not even the situation today for, for most of us. Um, most of us, if not all of us, are moving towards distributed systems for a variety of reasons. Um, when we have applications that are distributed, both in terms of the workload and in terms of the resources, we start talking about orchestration. We need to fence different resource allocations. We need to figure out how different components work together. Um, in the case of old applications, these applications are usually not meant to be containerized. Um, again, like I said, they were meant to run standalone, whereas today, you know, you have plenty of containers, pods, um, different services all running together, all sharing uh, a pool of resources that is your cluster or, or your data center or whatever that is. What this means to use, you know, doing the things we used to do in the past when it comes to resource allocation is not going to work when you're moving to distributed systems. That's true if you're migrating a legacy application. That's true if you're developing a new application to be cloud native. And it's, it's even true, as, as I'll show you, if you're just grabbing some example online and, and trying to run it um, on a cluster in a distributed fashion. So getting up and running with Kubernetes. Uh, I don't know how many of you are actually running uh, applications on Kubernetes now. For those of you who have already gone down the path uh, or journey of Kubernetes, you know how easy it is, right? Super simple, you just get a cluster, you get your application, you deploy, everything's nice and life is great. Um, obviously, I, I do that. Facetiously, Kubernetes is uh, amazing for many different ways. Simplicity is, is not one of them. Um, you know, when we, when we first want to get our distributed application up and running and, and focusing on Kubernetes, first step is grab a cluster. Uh, honestly, not, not the, the not the painful process that it used to be in the past. You can go on GTD or EKS today, and click a few buttons, uh, give them a credit card and, and get a cluster up and running. And then the second step is, well, let me take an application that I want to run, I want to design and deploy it, right? I, I can write it separately and then deploy it to the cluster. That is not as simple a process as getting a cluster up and running. I need to figure out, well, what are the different components that need to be allocated different resources? How do I find them? How do I make sure they share the right amount of resources and they all sort of behave nicely together? How do I make sure they scale the right way so that when my applications are load, they actually behave the way I want them to behave? And this, this really this is the crux of what we're going to be talking about today. How do you take an application and you make sure you set the right parameters for in order for it to behave the way you want it to behave? So starting with the very basics. We're talking about resource allocation. We have to talk about the resources themselves and what we have available to us. So in Kubernetes, there are a few what I would call native types, things that are managed uh, by Kube for you. The memory, the CPU. I'm not going to touch page sizes as much, but it's good to know that it's out there. 
those are things that natively we all think about when we start thinking about resource allocation, right? Whenever someone says, well, how many resources does your application need? The immediate thought is, well, how much memory and CPU does each pod or does each container need, right? How much is this gonna consume? How much memory does this database need in order to not crash or flow over? How much CPU do I need to give to my workers so that they can perform and give me performance that I expect or the, the users will have the performance that I expect? Underlying those, let's say, you know, as a second, as a second order, there is a slew of parameters um, or a slew of resources that we still need to think of, right? If you're running a Java application um, for, for the Java crowd, um, if you've ever tried to run a, a Java application in a distributed fashion and didn't have to tinker with a JVM, um, you're probably some sort of magician. Uh, that's amazing. But JVM heap size is super critical to think about when you're when you're splitting up your resources. Uh, the same goes for resources. Obviously, disk, there's tons under it. Um, and there's a lot of things that we as developers need to touch these days in order to make sure the applications are running in a stable fashion. The first thing to think about when you're going to Kubernetes is requests and limits. Um, I'm going to have to make a slight note on the word request. This is obviously within the Kubernetes world. So for those of you who aren't as familiar with Kubernetes, the requests I'm talking about here are not to be conflated with HTTP requests. These are not the, the, the same requests. This is a particular sort of reserve word in, in Kubernetes. When you start an application and you define an application, when you write the manifests for an application, the definitions of what the application is, you can um, specify two things at the container level, requests and limits. Requests for any given resource is as it sounds. Me as the container, I'm requesting a gig of memory in order to operate, right? The minimal amount of resource that I need in order to be able to carry on my, my operations. The actual resources designed to me can be bigger than the requests, but they can't be smaller. If I don't have in my cluster enough resources to give to each, to, to, to the container requesting it, then the container just won't start. The complement to that is limits. So if we said requests is the absolute minimal number uh, that I need in order to operate, limit is the absolute limit. Here's where I would say, you know, I can have a container. I would define the request for the memory for the container as one gigabyte memory. I can define the limit as two gigabytes. Give me at a bare minimum one gig. I need that to operate, but don't ever give me more than two because I know I don't need it. Maybe I've run some tests on it before. Maybe I just don't have it. Limits is where you set the right guardrails to make sure your applications don't, don't uh, and your containers and your pods don't get ahead of themselves and um, you know, overrun your cluster. So what does it actually look like when we go to deploy an application? So on the right-hand side, you can see a snippet of a manifest. If you've never seen a manifest before, um, great starting point to Kubernetes, it's all based on YAML files and, and we write things as verbosely as possible. So what you see here is a pod that has two containers, uh, and the two containers have explicit limits and requests for both CPU and memory. When I go to deploy it, um, I may have a node, and sort of see a, a simple picture on the left. I have a node that has a certain amount of CPU and memory. And Kubernetes will ask, well, okay, can I deploy this pod to this node? And what it checks for is the total number of requests given by all the containers on the pod, both on memory and CPU. So if I look at this, I have a total request of 1.5 gigs of memory, and I have a total request of 0.6 cores on the CPU. When I deploy this pod, um, Kube will basically go and look for a node that has enough of those, right? If it doesn't, this pod cannot, cannot be deployed. If it does, it'll slap it on a node, and, and um, I'm gonna be talking about scheduling in bits and pieces. I won't go into it too deeply, but the process of putting a pod on a node is called scheduling inside Kubernetes. So that's on the requests, right? If I have enough, I'll be put on a certain node. The limits, as I said before, is once the pod is on the node, dynamically it can be allocated more or less resources. This manifest on the, on the right guarantees that this pod will not get more than three gigs of memory overall. Uh, and the same for 1.5 cores. So again, those are the, the very, very basic uh, of requests and limits at the pod and, and container level. So when we go to write these manifests, right, the, the whole goal here at the end of the day is to assign values to the memory and CPU at the pod and, and container level. And like I said, not just memory and CPU, right? We're gonna get to places where it's, it's way broader than that. 
how do we think about these numbers and how do we think about what should I put there? Well, obviously there's, there's gonna be some sort of Goldilocks that, that may or may not even be static. Too low, if I set my requests and limits to be too low, what I'm gonna face is performance degradation, right? Don't give, don't give enough memory to your database, it might crash. Don't give enough uh, CPU to a worker, your users are gonna be experiencing high latency. Too high, which I will admit uh, is the default that I see today and, and the default we all sort of converge to if we don't know what we're doing. If I say, you know what, I have no idea what my database needs to be, just give it five gigs, but it'll be fine. Um, I'm running into two issues there. The first one is obviously I'm just wasting resources, right? I, if, if I don't truly need it, then my database is gonna sit there idle, uh, eating away at both my credit card bill and my ability to deploy other applications to my cluster. Um, more than that, if I did constrain my cluster to, to a certain size, and now I'm requesting large chunks of memory and CPU, what I'm gonna end up with is unscheduled pods. And Kubernetes is gonna come back to me and say, sorry, I, I just don't have room for this. And then I'm gonna have to go back, basically go back to the drawing board, figure out, well, why am I requesting five gigs and what, what do I actually have left? I'll have to go through deployment and monitoring and do this manual process that I'll describe later to figure out, well, what, where, what is just right? Um, and at the end, we'll get to a, a really nice automated process to get the just right. So that's on request and limits as a baseline. Obviously, it's with everything uh, Kubernetes, there's always a, a more complex layer. And in this case, it's the quality of service. So quality of service is something that I will admit I was not aware of when I first started with Kubernetes. I heard requests and limits, numbers make perfect sense to me, let's just go. But actually there's a second order of complexity here um, that is tied to the relationship between the requests and the limits at the pod level. So uh, quality of service is a, a definition at the pod level. And there are basically three classes for quality of service, guaranteed, burstable, and best effort. And they are just as they sound. Guaranteed in order for a pod to be classified as guaranteed quality of service, every container inside the pod has to have a definition of both limits and requests, and those have to be equal to each other. So what does that mean? It means that for every container, I say, I'm requesting one CPU of memory, and my limit is one CPU of memory. That means it is the safest bet I can take. Hey, always, always, always give this container one CPU of memory. Always, always, always give this container two gigs, uh, sorry, one CPU, one core CPU and two gigs of memory or whatever it is. There's no fluctuation, um, you know, there's no questions on whether or not I'm, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna eat more resources and have noisy neighbors or anything like that. What it does incur is rigidity on scheduling. So like we said before, in order to schedule a pod, in order to place a pod on a node, that node has to have enough resources to accommodate the pod. Um, because I'm being rigid, with my requests and limits, I'm likely gonna go over what my baseline is, which means I'll have a harder time scheduling. I'm gonna have a very rigid scheduling um, of the pods, and I'm probably gonna to have to, to bump up my cluster a little bit, or at least understand the exact resource utilization of my cluster. The next class of quality of service is burstable. So again, just as the name suggests, these are pods that are meant to be well, burstable. They're meant to uh, be able to respond to a workload by upping their resources, but hopefully stay at a, at a lower baseline. So where does this come in? You can think of maybe an e-commerce application that during the day sees a very low threshold of activity. And then 5 p.m. when everyone logs off Slack, they go in and they start buying stuff and I, I get this sort of a spike. Well, how do I want to, to get my requests and limits in? I don't wanna set them at the baseline level because if I do, when I see that spike, things are gonna start crashing. Uh, I also don't wanna set them at the spike level because that means that 80% of my day, I'll just be wasting resources. This is where burstable, uh, is, burstable pods are an option. Burstable pods are defined as those that the limits are actually larger than the request, but strictly larger, they're not equal, meaning they're not in the guarantee. What this will do is it will allow me to schedule the pods um, more easily than I would have in a guaranteed quality of service, but it will also allow the pods to extend um, their resources if something comes in and there's a bigger workload. By setting the limits larger, I basically tell the, I tell Kubernetes and I, the, the pod tells Kubernetes, hey, I can stretch up to three gigs or I can stretch up three cores or whatever it is. The downside here is uh, a term I mentioned before and I'll mention again uh, several times, noisy neighbors. 
So now you can imagine if I have multiple burstable pods on a single node and they request more resources at the same time, right? Because one thing we don't control is when, when do these resources get allocated? There are ways of controlling it. Those, those are much more advanced and sort of uh, in real time. You can see a place where one service requested more resources at a given moment, basically throttled the node. Now I can't schedule or I can't even um, get more juice out of the other, other pods on the node. My third class, best effort. Um, again, it is as it sounds. No requests or limits set uh, at all. This is the most dangerous option. And I'll, I'll show you an example later. It's actually one of those things that if you were not aware of the best effort quality of service, uh, you, you may have fallen into it because you just didn't set anything verbosely. Two things that are gonna happen with best effort. So one, again, I keep talking about scheduling. There's, there's something in scheduling uh, that determines the priority of each pod. Best effort pods are gonna be evicted first. Meaning if you didn't set anything and some other pod needs more resources now, Kube might just kick your pod out altogether um, and it'll get evicted from, from the node. The, the other side to that is by not setting a limit, what is likely to happen is you'll just grab as much as you can. We're now going back to sort of the old days where, where parts of the application can just grab as many resources as they can, thereby throttling anyone else um, that's on the node. So what usually happens? What do we usually do? And this is uh, called these little sins are, are something that every single one of us have done. Um, again, if someone contradicts me with this, I'm gonna call you a, a magician, but someone, everyone has done this to some extent, right? Going with defaults or just ignoring it altogether. Well, I have my application, right? I, I used to run this. We've, we've ran this application for 20 years. I don't need to change anything. It runs just fine. Well, we, we've talked about this. Cloud native architecture is not the same as what you're used to running on monoliths. And it will require resourcing updates. At a bare minimum, it requires sort of fencing. Even if the total number of resources is set, understanding the different components of your, of your application and the resources required for those different components is critical. Um, something similar, hopping from a blog post. And I'll show you an example of, of just that if I, if I have time. Configurations that work for someone uh, is, is the equivalent of it runs on my machine. Um, the configurations and the actual parameters that you set in your application are specific to your application, your cluster, and most importantly, your workload. Even if you have the exact same cluster, but you're seeing different traffic patterns, you may be seeing completely different behaviors for the exact same configuration. You have to tune your configuration to the workload. And then the third thing is not testing this, not going through a rigorous process. This isn't something that's historically been part of our um, toolkit as developers. We never had to think about this, we just deployed. Um, deploying blind is super dangerous. Um, you know, the first step could be things don't deploy. Honestly, that's even the safer option. Um, the more risky option is it does deploy when you deploy it. And then, you know, at two in the morning when, when someone on the other side of the world wakes up and starts um, doing transactions, it crashes. So we have to make sure we tune our application to our specific needs, application, cluster, and the workload itself. Converse to that, what should we be doing? Well, first of all, uh, I've mentioned quality of service you have to understand the quality of service of your pods. Um, like I said before, when I started, I didn't even know what quality of service was. I didn't know that it existed. And the class itself is just as important as the numbers um, that you assign to the request and limits. You have to think of the different pods and how critical they are to the operation of the application. Some may have higher priorities than others, and you have to set the quality of service in that way. Your critical pods, I'm gonna say, have to be guaranteed. They don't have to, but they have to take high priority when it comes to the actual uh, resources you allocate to them and the confidence that you have in those pods getting those resources. Um, noisy neighbors already talked about this. Depending on the number of your nodes and the number of your services, you have to start planning for what happens if these two pods fall in the same node. Um, and and the, the last point here is obviously dynamic loads. I've talked about the load itself. If you have a very static load that is constant throughout the day, there's not a lot of reason to go with burstable pods. All they're gonna get you is, is just more noise in the system. If, if you have a way of tailoring your requirements um, of your resources to a good baseline, you'll save money um, and, and you won't have stability issues. Specifying resources explicitly, someone tied to quality of service, right? Don't ever, ever, ever use best effort. Um, 
some people may yell at me for saying that, but I'm, I, I'm gonna say that as a, as a source of truth, don't use best effort. It's, it's not stable enough. And more than that, your fellow developers, if I come into a manifest and I don't see anything specified, I'm probably just gonna gloss over it if I don't know what I'm looking for. Increased visibility into what the resources are is always good for you. Um, the last thing it provides you, and I'll, I'll show you in a second, if you do have resources specified explicitly in your manifest, then at least you can tell um, later on when you, when you go and you iterate on the configurations, if you have um, either history, if you're going with GitOps, or at least a way to see and tune things individually. Um, last thing, which I haven't talked about a lot, and again, it's a whole sort of separate topic, is, is quotas. So if you really want to manage your cluster well, if you really want to keep a tight ship, set quotas at the namespace level. Separate out your applications to namespaces and understand what each application needs to get. If you set that correctly, if you know that this application as a whole, again, needs two gigs of memory and two cores fully, set that quota. And then you can backtrack from that to the different containers and pods and understand how to separate those out. So now let's talk about actual tuning and, and the actual uh, um, process of getting to the right numbers. I mentioned before, you know, if we have all these, what we call parameters, and I'll show you in a second why, we have all these parameters, we have all these resources that we want to tune. The issue is the number of these parameters grows exponentially with the complexity of, of your application, right? If I look at a, at a simple, simple, simple application, five services, I'll show you in a second, and I want to tune resource limits requests for those five services. So imagine, maybe I make it easier on myself. I have five pods, each pod has one container. For each container, I wanna tune requests, limits of memory and CPU. I'm looking at 20, 20 numbers that I need to set and I haven't touched replicas, I haven't touched JVM, if I have Java in there, I haven't touched anything internally. Um, I will say, me personally, as a human, being able to see 20 numbers at the same time, all of which are correlated to some extent, obviously, because when the application runs, there's a lot of things happening in the background. Incredibly hard. I, I don't have a good mental tally of 20 different numbers and I can say, well, if I just tweak this one a little bit higher, a little bit lower, um, I could get to the right answer. Um, again, we talked about distributed systems. When you run these things, a lot of things happen in the background. It's completely dynamic there's no way to just immediately know, oh, I understand completely how the application works. You have things that are out of your control unless you really, really lock down how your scheduling works, how your resource allocation works. Everything's gonna be dynamic because that's part of the power of Kubernetes. Um, because the allocation is, is dynamic and it's out of one shared pool, this tuning is a moving target. And that's what we talked about earlier with scaling and I'll, I'll talk about that again in a second. Not all tunings meet the same kind of criteria when it comes to a workload. All that is to say, actually tuning, if you're trying to do this by hand, it's an incredibly inefficient and tedious process. Um, not sort of dare anyone to come and tell me that they actually like it. So where do we see this process come in and where is it important to actually look into it? I will admit that a lot of us have not even thought of, of doing this, right? Um, a couple of years ago, we strongly believe that as part of your CICD process, as part of your CICD pipeline, there has to come a step in which you tune your parameter values inside your application. And where that part comes is between your unit testing. So I went and I build a new component. Obviously I do some unit testing. Uh, I push it maybe to, to a staging area and I want to start doing integration tests. The integration tests historically tell me, well, all these things work together. You know, data is flowing from one to another. My requests are coming in, nothing's malformed, everything's okay. But as we've talked about before, it, that has nothing to do with your workload. It doesn't say anything about your application being stable or being able to meet multiple loads. This is where tuning the actual resource requirements and the different parameters inside your application becomes critical. As, as you do integration tests and as you sort of build the application back up, you have to put it under load when you have to think of which resources am I, am, am I allocating where? And will this meet the demands of, of the business at the end of the day? All that has to come before deployment and all that has to be done continuously. This isn't a fire, forget, well, I did this once, now I'm done. The application evolves, the workload evolves, the clusters evolve, and the other applications around your application evolves, right? If you have you know, 10 or 50 other developers putting stuff on the cluster, you're gonna run through these noisy neighbors all the time. You're gonna have to keep tuning your application as you go. So all this process has to be as automated as possible. 
So some options that, that we have as, as developers. The first one I already talked about, trial and error. I'll just put something. Hopefully I won't ignore it. At the very least, I'll put some number to my parameters and you know, I'll, I'll deploy it and cross my fingers, hope nothing breaks in production. Um, easiest way to get started. Absolute worst way to, to make your time efficient and valuable. And again, I personally have done this manually. Uh, I hated it because it's, it's confusing, it's not intuitive, and, and there's nothing, at least to me, incredibly rewarding about doing sort of manual tuning and figuring out, ooh, what, what is the memory and CPU that I need to have in this, this particular piece? Um, an option that I particularly like as a scientist is, is do what we call a design of experiment. So treat optimization as, as a scientific experiment. Say, well, I have some numbers that I need to figure out. I need to do this methodically, and I need to think it through. Maybe I have some things that I already know. Maybe I deployed this application before and, and my DevOps team came back and told me, hey, we monitored this and this pod is really getting throttled on CPU. Or, hey, we, you know, we're monitoring the resources and you, know, you, you asked for five gigs, but really you're utilizing one. So I have a couple of, of ideas. I can take two or three parameters at most and try to come up with a grid of potential values and just go ahead and run through all of them. Run tests and see what works the best. Um, this works significantly better than doing trial and error. It's, like I said, it's, it's scientific, it's methodical. At least you're thinking through the problem and you're getting some, some kind of information out. Um, but as I mentioned before, like the higher your complexity, the harder it's gonna be to, to manage multiple parameters at the same time. Two or three is, uh, is, is a good number. If you get to five, you're already um, starting to be uh, thoroughly confused. The third option and one that I'll show you soon is, is using machine learning. And I'll explain later why machine learning is a, is a perfect uh, use case for this. The goal that we are uh, pushing towards is running this thing automatically. No developer should sit there and try to think exactly if they need one or two cores or whatever. They need to understand the overall architecture of the system. They need to define sort of high level definitions um, of this test or what we call an experiment. They need to go ahead and run this automatically, intelligently, automatically, completely hands off. All you have to do is say, hey, I want to tune these 10 parameters, and I think they should vary between X and Y, whatever it is. Tell me what the best configuration is. Um, and as I mentioned before, this, this continuous optimization process should be closely tied to your CICD pipeline so that whenever you have a new release or you have a new tweak or whatever it is that you do, you run through this if you think that it's going to have a meaningful impact on your cluster or the other applications, uh, applications that are running. So, Quickly on, on the platform that we have Red Sky Apps and how do we do it. I mentioned the words experiments and parameters. Um, what we provide is an ability to, to do this design of experiment, but at a much larger scale, much, much faster and, and much more scientific than what I can do by you know, guessing on a grid. You as a developer, like I said, you define uh, a few things. Parameters, those are the things you want to tune. So memory, CPU for the following pods could be two, could be five, could be whatever you want. You want to tune the JVM, you can tune the JVM at the same time. Um, replicas, disk size, whatever it is, anything that you can expose, uh, the platform can tune. And the nice thing about Kubernetes is the whole point is to be as flexible as possible. We can expose almost anything we want in there. Once we have that definition, um, the experiment itself is completely automated. So the machine learning model explores the parameter space and it comes back with uh, configurations to try. And we have our own Kubernetes controller, which I'll show you in a second, which actually goes ahead and tries the different configuration. Each one of those we call a trial. As it tries those, the machine learning model learns from the performance of the application and it learns what the parameter space uh, looks like. Now, one thing that, that's really, really important to mention here, like we're optimizing towards something, right? I keep saying, well, we want an optimized application, but what does it mean to be optimized? And the, the reality of the situation is, Optimal application is completely up to you, right? And this is why uh, before I said defaults, if you take someone else's defaults, you're also taking their assumption of what does it mean for their application to be performing? It could be low latency, it could be high throughput. Maybe you just want to minimize resource utilization overall while the application sort of doesn't crash. All of those use cases are, are valid and they're driven by either the developer needs or the business needs. And so we allow you to define the different metrics that you want to tune for. So you can say, again, hey, I have these 10 parameters that I want to tune. I want to focus on two metrics. One is throughput, 
I want to get as many users uh, in as possible, and I want to minimize my overall resource utilization. So maximize throughput and, and minimize utilization. And the machine learning model will learn the optimal result, or in this case, results if you have uh, competing metrics for that and give you the optimal configuration. So let me show you a quick example. I'll show you an example of the pitfalls and, and how we actually end up solving it. Um, some of you may know the Docker dogs versus cats voting app. Somewhat simple app, like I said, simple, five services, right? I have my back end that calculates the results. I have a Redis queue, I have a worker, a DB, and the actual front end uh, that I serve to, to the user. And it's, it's sort of up there, it's available. I can always go and, and pull this example online. Right, so this is where sort of these blog posts come in. Hey, I saw this cool thing. I'm starting with Kubernetes. Would love to get this thing deployed. I go to GitHub, I call the repo. You know what? Even better, they have a whole folder on Kubernetes specifications. Fantastic. Here are the five services: DB, Redis, Result, Vote, and Worker. I go into the Result service. Okay, looks good. Um, hopefully, you'll immediately notice that the word requests, limits, memory, CPU, replicas, nothing's there. All these manifests in, in Docker's uh, repo, they're all gonna be defined as best effort because um, none of the services have any kind of requests in, or limits in them. So what's gonna happen if I actually try to deploy it? So uh, I have a little cluster here. I have the, uh, the application itself. I will admit I made tiny tweaks so that I can uh, expose the actual voting service and show it to you. But really all I'm doing is, I just go ahead and kubectl apply everything that's in there. Um, and, and pray a little bit that it's, it's going to deploy, right? So, okay, everything's created. I'm going to go to the cluster and see. Everything looks good so far, right? See the last few uh, stragglers. You know what? I'm done. I deployed. I'm, I'm actually wrong. There's nothing wrong here. Everything works fantastically well. Um, well, like I said, this, this is part of the old way of, of doing things is, is assuming that if the application deployed, you're actually running well. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and uh, do a little port forwarding so you guys can see the application. Uh, so all I'm doing now is just uh, forwarding both the result and the uh, voting service. So I have these two guys up here. So really what the application looks like is this. Uh, it's waiting for incoming votes. There's no votes yet. And all it's gonna tell me is what is the percentage of people who voted for dogs versus cats? Like I said, application's running. I can see it. I mean, more than that, I can just go ahead and vote and obviously I'm gonna vote for dogs. Um, boom, 100%, application's working fantastically well. Obviously in this day and age, you have to, to do some sort of performance test on your application. So for that, I have um, Locust up and running. Let's imagine I wanted to expose this, you know, I wanna put this up on Twitter and obviously have a huge following and have everyone vote cats versus dogs. Um, I'll do a thousand users, not even that much. Spawn a couple of users a second um, and start swarming. Okay, so far so good. This thing is up and running. You'll see the votes come in at the bottom. Oop, 433 votes and looks like I'm, I'm choking. Um, yeah, too many files open. My incoming connections are already starting to drop. My performance is already degrading. Um, by doing this out of the box, I've managed to get 433 votes in before my application crashed. Definitely not, not something I, I, I wanna do. So what can I do now? Well, I can go into the logs. I can start looking at certain things, see if I can maybe get some more CPU. Is it the, is it the workers? Is it the queue? Ooh, things are coming back up again. Okay, great. Some, some, you know, something cleared up. Should I go maybe into the database? Maybe it's the Python backend. I have, I have no idea. I have no idea what, um, what's actually causing the issues and, and there are plenty of ways to debugging it. My point is, I don't want to. This, this part, the part of trying to figure out where should I put in requests and limits for my application is not something that I, I'm, I find particularly um, you know, intriguing. So I'll show you very quickly um, how to do this in a, in a sort of scientific and automatic fashion. So with Red Sky Apps, uh, like I mentioned, we have our own controller, which I'll show you, you can grab from, from GitHub. You install the controller in, in the cluster. Um, I think I have mine installed as well, but you can just see we have our own tool called Red Sky CTL. We run Red Sky CTL in it, 10, 20 seconds, and, and you have a controller. You'll see it unchanged because um, I think I already had it installed, but it takes a, the same amount of time. 
once I have Red Sky CTL and I've logged in, we have a we have a, a completely free tier you can use to connect to a machine learning model. I can go ahead and define an experiment. So I have my voting app, and like I said, I haven't defined requests and limits for any of my services. So at a bare minimum, I want to start defining my parameters and tuning my parameters um, for for the different services. And I'll show you here. We have ten. So we're tuning replicas, CPU, and memory for, for most, of the, most of the services. You'll see Redis in the database and um, the back end and the worker. The only thing I don't actually tune is the front end in this case. And as I mentioned, you know, the question is, what are you tuning for? So in this experiment file, uh, which is sort of our, our proprietary YAML to define these experiments, I want to do two things. I want to maximize my throughput, meaning I want to get as many votes in as possible. And I want to minimize you can think of costs here as basically cluster resources. I don't want to pay a lot for this. It's just a hobby app, right? So get me as, as low a cost as possible. Once I've defined this, um, everything that we do is sort of um, Kube native. So I, I can just go ahead and apply it. And as soon as these things come up, you'll see pods uh, come live. And what I'm going to do now is basically wait. Uh, I'm going to wait for the machine learning model to come back with a few suggestions. So so this is the Red Sky Apps UI. You can see I already have an example uh, that I started. This is the, the example that I just started running. It's going to take it a while to run. Basically, what's happening now in the background is the controller set the machine learning model of the experiment, said, hey, here are my definitions. Go run this experiment and tell me what's going on. The machine learning model started suggesting what we call trials, which is uh, to say configurations, and the, the controller tries them. So as you saw those pods come up, basically the controller is spinning up the application and loading it. So we actually have Locust served inside the cluster to, to perform a, a performance test on the application. So what you see here is a, is a completed experiment. It can take anything from like 30 minutes to, to maybe an hour or two depending on the complexity of your, of your application. And each one of these guys is what we call a trial. Um, and, and you can see here at the bottom, the different configurations uh, of each one of the trials. Like I said, we're tuning 10 parameters automatically. And at the end of the day, what you're left with is these, what we call best. So these points, um, otherwise known as the Pareto front, are the ones that can't be beat on both throughput and cost. You can't get something which is super cheap and super performant at the same time, but you do get the trade-offs. So instead of me going in and tinkering with 10 parameters and trying to figure out, you know, am I here? Am I here? Am I somewhere in the middle? I have no visibility in any of this. I can just get all of this automated and then find the configuration that I want. Go ahead, export the manifest and deploy and be done with it. So a couple of last notes before I, I open up for questions. Um, I just want to talk about the machine learning model really briefly. Why, why machine learning? So obviously I'm heavily biased uh, towards machine learning being, uh, uh, you know, having a background in machine learning myself. But really this is not just to say we're doing machine learning uh, for the sake of machine learning. The core of the issue here is the complexity and, and the number of parameters and really what we would call the dimensionality of the parameter space. I don't know a human that can fit in their brain uh, 10 parameters, let alone 20. And so, we have to use a machine learning model that can handle that kind of complexity, that level of complexity. It can explore the parameter space way more efficiently than we can. If you look at the number of trials I had up there, uh, I had about 200 trials. And again, I challenge every one of you to, to go through 200 trials and give me the same kind of results for, for throughput and cost. And the nice thing about our optimization process, it's completely like problem agnostic. I don't need like a, a whiz data scientist. I don't need a lot of data upfront. All I need to know is what's your application, your actual uh, manifest, and the parameters that you want to tune. Right? You define the parameters, you define the metrics, and, and you define the, um, the load test, and, and you just you run it. So with that, uh, uh, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you all for coming. Um, again, I, I, I highly encourage you, if you're only taking uh, a few things out of this, is think about your resource allocation. Really think about how you uh, tune it ahead of time not as an afterthought, but something you do pre-deployment. Make sure you understand what your quality of service is um, and, and really think about having this as part of your process. This tuning and optimization process is a critical piece of your CI CD pipeline in general. Cool.
And uh, with that, I'm going to go to Q&A panel. Um, so first of all, what is the role of, of limits on the container level? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by, by container level, um, but I would say like uh, limits as I'll, I'll go back to, um, well, I'll go back to, to, to the original slide. Limits is, is as it sounds. The container, if you set the limits to be one CPU, all this container will ever be able to get is one CPU. We'll never be able to get more than one core, essentially. Same goes for memory. Um, someone asked if we have two containers in one pod, each has a limit of one CPU request of 0.5 CPU. It's great, I feel like I'm in math class. Uh, request of 0.5 CPU, how much more will be reserved? So the, the word reserved is, is interesting. So really what I have is I have a total request of, of 0.5 CPU, sorry, I have a total request of, of one CPU. Right, if I have two containers, each one of them have half. If I can still do arithmetic, then I'm going to get to one core. Uh, I, the, the word reserved is, uh, you know, I, I'm going to say it the other way. So that it's reserved. Who will look for a node that has one free core of CPU in order to, to schedule this pod? Once it's been scheduled, it can burst up to what? Two cores, right? Um, but at a bare minimum, it has to be scheduled on a node that has one free uh, core CPU. So this is, is Red Sky Apps available for any Kubernetes distribution, be it on cloud or on premises? Absolutely. Um, you know, we support, we have back support. I, f I forget which version, but, but really we go back uh, quite a lot. Um, when it comes to on premises, if you have, if you're air gapped, uh, then, then come talk to us. Right now, the, the free tier offering is obviously hosted by us. So you need to have some sort of internet connectivity. Um, so I, I suggest trying it on, on one of the cloud providers, but if you have a, a need for something more than that, we have complete capability to deploy everything on-prem. Uh, do you do auto scaling in real time or only using experiments? Uh, oh, I, this, this, I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, so I'll, I'll talk about a few things at the same time. So first of all, auto scaling, um, I'm, I'm gonna, talk about the actual kube native auto scalers in a second but before that i would say for scaling in general if we're thinking about what we talked about with with varying loads uh varying workloads there are ways for you to run multiple multiple experiments that tailor multiple loads or run an experiment that has a variable load in it uh, and then what you can do is you either run an experiment with a variable load and you export the manifest for that or something that i particularly like is, is doing what i call scenarios I basically I can run a scenario for low, 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 medium, high, or whatever that is, and export all three, and then save them. We currently don't have um, a, a way for you to switch between them in production because we don't work in production, uh, but we're working towards sort of extending our pipeline completely. Right now, you would basically have to um, switch between scenarios yourself, basically, uh, kubectl apply, go through whatever process you go to, to apply the different scenarios. Um, on auto scaling in general, I will say we're working towards um, optimizing your auto scalers themselves. So, uh, as part of your experiment, you can tune the HPA, for instance. Like, if, if you know you're deploying with the HPA, you can actually expose the HPA's parameters in the experiment. And then, what you get is an intelligent auto scaler inside your experiment. So, basically, you, you're making your whole system, the, the entire Kubernetes ecosystem, more intelligent. Um, would this work with cloud native K as a service, EKS, Rancher? Yes to all of it. So um, we work ourselves, like our stuff is deployed on both GKE and EKS. We're perfectly fine with that. Uh, Rancher is a, is a good partner of ours. Um, I'm gonna say yes across the board. Um, in the case of replicas, what kind of load balancing do you consider how load balancing can affect uh, vertical scaling? It's, it's a good question. I mean, right now, if you go to our recipes repo, so you can see here, uh, Red Scraps recipes, we have uh, multiple recipes, including the one I showed you that um, does tune the replicas. Um, I think we, we basically use one kind of load balancer. I don't know. I honestly haven't looked too much into uh, how that would affect vertical scaling, but I'm wondering if that's something that you can expose. I can tell you that we're working on adding you may have already added categorical parameters, so you don't have to put in numbers. You know, you can switch between different types of load balancing if you have something um, fancy and even incorporate that in your experiment. Um, how much does it cost? Free tier, just go up, sign up, um, and, and you can start today. You don't have to pay us anything. Um, 
show me the YAML for setting parameters and how you can set the limit request values in the container. Um, so all of this is online. I can go back to that soon if, if we still have time. I think we're, we're bumping up on the R soon. Um, the, the way you set the, the, the limits, actually, I'll just do it now. So the way you set the limits in the container. So here's the experiment file, right? This is the experiment that I started running. And I said, here are the parameters. What really happens is, as part of the experiment, we patch your manifests. So in the back here, in the application folder, I have a bunch of manifests. And we just go ahead and patch that uh, based on the values that we get from the machine learning model. I, I hope that answers the question. Um, So how do you keep the system pod stable, like the autoscaler pod, which is in the kube system? If the autoscaler pod goes down, uh, then the scaling advantages drop, how to tackle this. So this is, this is just a, a general question that we get a lot and I really like. Um, we find more and more people are interested in tuning more than just their application, but actually tuning kube resources. You totally can. Um, I don't have a great example. Like, like I said, we, we tune, we have great examples of tuning the HPA itself. So if that's part of your experiment, if, if the HPA pod sort of goes down or doesn't deploy, uh, our experiment will show that as a failed trial. And the machine learning model will learn from that. The machine learning model, one thing I haven't mentioned is it actually learns from failures. So it doesn't just keep trying things. If it notices space or areas in the parameter space where the application fails to deploy, it doesn't touch it anymore. Um, but yeah, you can add more and more Kube resources to your experiment and um, just keep going with that. Um, does it work with OpenShift or just regular Kates? I think we actually just had the first experiment on OpenShift uh, a week or two ago. So it does work on OpenShift. Um, and you know, if, if you have specific questions on, on versions and stuff like that, you can come talk to us. Um, previous question plus in the CICD. Uh, not, not sure what you mean. So right now, we what I showed you is sort of a standalone piece of what I consider to be a CICD pipeline. Um, we're working on building integrations into common um, CICD tools like Jenkins or, or Circle or whatever that is, but uh, I, I don't have that quite yet. So we're defining throttling through graph using Kibana. So I, I'm not sure if you mean in the experiment or just in general. I mean, obviously, if you have Prometheus, um, uh, well, Kibana and Grafana, honestly, like that, that totally depends on your deployment. Um, it's just, yes, you, you can find throttling. I mean, if, if, if you're looking to monitor your system and uh, look into specific things like throttling. I, I would recommend uh, Prometheus and Grafana and sort of online monitoring, but that's a that's a separate thing altogether. Um, how to manage two pods that burst at the same time? Should we use names visit to ensure these pods don't run on the same node ever? So um, that's a good question. Uh, you don't have to use namespaces. You can use taints and tolerations to to make sure pods don't land at the same place. Again, complete uh, other uh, other topic. Um, you know my 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 first step would actually to be to run an experiment with these two burstable pods and see how it works out. Because uh, if, if you do have issues, those will be surfaced throughout the experiment where if we don't control scheduling, if, if we use the, the native Kubernetes scheduler, as you go through trials, uh, you know, some of them will have more scheduling issues than others and you, you'll sort of coalesce to, to the right answer. But um, if you want to make, if, if you know you have those, you should just put taints on them ahead of time. Um, how does it affect the HPA and VPA? I, I, I just talked about this. Like basically, we, we believe that you should be tuning those um, as well as you run through these experiments. How much resources the Red Sky uh, controller in, in Kubernetes needs? Very little. Um, so yeah, you saw the little Red Sky um, system namespace in the Red Sky controller pod. Uh, you can go to our docs, Red Sky, uh, Red Sky um, It'll list everything. It's, it's incredibly minimal. Um, when a pod is deployed to a node, uh, okay, when the pod is put to a node where the limit is higher than what is available on the node, it causes the app to either unremember or evict the pod when it exceeds uh, the availability. How do you handle this? So this is where it's, it's I, I believe what you're talking about is actually having a, um, uh, well, it doesn't have to be a burstable, well, it has to be a burstable quality of service because if, if, no, if there's no memory available, then it won't be scheduled. This we're doing experiments with uh, burstable quality of services. Interesting. Again, the experiment, you know, you can just run. Um, we recommend running 20x trials to the number of parameters. It gives you a really, really good coverage. And the experiment itself will see it, right? So if the pod gets evicted or the app crashes, like I said before, the machine learning model will learn from it. 
Um, and so it'll keep trying. And if, if there's no other place to schedule it, then you'll see your experiment is just not succeeding. Then you'll have to go back and, and uh, make sure maybe you don't have enough nodes. You gotta, you gotta figure out like, you gotta limit the, the, um, the numbers even more. How can you tie the patches into customize? Well, we already use customize. I mean, if you saw me, I, I run the experiment using customize and um, basically everything that we do, you can then go ahead and, and export using customize patch. Um, I hope that answers the question. Um, that's all these questions I think are coming in at different times. I think I have a couple of more. Uh, is it required to have an account to Red Sky uh, to use the application? Can we train the ML on premise? So um, yes to the second question, I talked about that briefly. We can deploy the machine learning uh, model on premise. Uh, come talk to us for that. Uh, do you have to have an account to use this application? So in order to use the machine learning model, you just sign up for an account online, super easy, just email. Um, if you don't wanna give us your email, the, the controller itself is completely open source. You can go ahead and get the controller and you can still run experiments. So you'll see in the docs the suggest command. Um, what it means is you won't have the intelligence behind the experiment because you won't be connected to the machine learning model. You can still run, you know, sort of the second option that I mentioned of, of design of experiment. Uh, and I think that is it. Uh, unless someone has any other question. Cool. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Um, and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks everyone. Have a great day.